Well, uh, good morning, good evening, as the case may be. And uh, thank you very much for joining us and Conversations with Jack. Today, we have Mustafa from Lazy Ledger. Um, and, and I'm very excited to chat with you, Mustafa, about what you guys have been working on and tell the cosmonauts a little bit more about Lazy Ledger, which is going to be an exciting thing for the ecosystem here in the next few years. But uh, first, do want to take a minute to thank our sponsors. Um, the first sponsor we have is Sommelier Finance, which is the company that I work for. Um, we're building tooling for liquidity providers on Uniswap. And we got a couple of really exciting announcements coming up here over the next month. We're going to be supporting Uniswap v3 at launch. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, stay tuned at sommelier.finance. Go sign up for our telegrams, go sign up for our Twitter, uh, and we'll be updating more there soon. Our other sponsor today, as always, is Omniflix Media. Um, just want to take a moment to thank Sisla and the team for producing this podcast. Um, and they're also working on a really exciting Cosmos chain to support uh, artists and creators putting out their own content and media. So I would really encourage you to go over and check out Omniflix.network. So uh, awesome. Well, Mustafa, do you want to take a minute to, to introduce yourself? Tell the folks a little bit about your background? Sure. So I'm the co-founder of Lazy Ledger. Um, which is kind of a project that I started as part of my PhD research at the University College London. I have a background in layer one scalability. Um, I used to work on some of the first sharding projects and protocols. I used to collaborate a little bit with Ethereum research and um, I started Lazy Ledger late 2019. What was your PhD in? So, um, the, I mean, the subject of my PhD was scaling um, blockchains on the base layer. So specifically focusing on layer one scalability, um, including sharding and um, also scaling validation using techniques like fraud and data availability proofs. Yeah, I think I saw last year you you just d successfully defended your PhD thesis, thesis like last fall, right? Yeah, last fall. Of, yeah, it's, uh, I did it in November. Nice, very cool. And I guess that program takes like three or four years. Yeah, PhD in the UK takes three or four years. Um, two to four years. Three to four years, but I mean, it's, you know, it varies. It's it's as long as you have like three or four good papers, you can you can go and defend your thesis. Nice. Um, and that that work kind of led directly to to Lazy Ledger, the 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 fraud proofs and, and data availability work. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, Lazy Ledger was like something I was thinking about um, for a very long time, um, conceptually speaking. I was kind of looking at the design paradigm of Bitcoin and systems like Ethereum. And um, I was kind of trying to really understand like on a fundamental deep level, why are they designed that way? Um, at least from a layer one perspective. And I started questioning alternative design paradigms. Um, it's like, like the question for me was, what is the minimal like blockchain you can have? Like if we strip back a blockchain, decentralized blockchain to its core components, what do you get and can it still work? So Lazy Ledger is kind of the answer to that. And at first it was kind of this theoretical product uh, project, um, it was kind of a theoretical question. But then over time, you kind of realize this has like very significant practical implementations, um, especially within Cosmos and especially specifically for people that want to build a decentralized blockchain, um, but just need this pluggable consensus layer such as Lazy Ledger, without actually having to care about um, building their own consensus layer using proof of stake or something like that. So it, it, talk to me a little bit of, uh, more about when you're thinking about the basic components of a blockchain, because whenever I think of a blockchain, I always think of a database, but Lazy Ledger's, you know, does have that, that database type thing, but there's also a bunch of more components about it. So talk to me about the different components. Sure. So, I mean, if we strip back any layer one blockchain to its core components, um, there's really two core things that are that you need to 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 have a blockchain um, that at least does that can do like anything that any modern blockchain can do from an applications perspective. And those two things are number one, um, you need transactions to be ordered. You need ordering on transactions. So, like when users submit transactions. You need a way to agree on the order of those transactions. 
So basically consensus. And the second thing you need um, is data availability. So once you order, once people agree on the order of the transactions and commit to the order of the transactions, you need to be sure that the data behind those transactions have actually been published publicly to the network. And effectively, those are the two core things you need to prevent um, double spending. So like imagine a version of Bitcoin where there's no on-chain rules. Like you're allowed to you're allowed to submit transactions on the on the chain that double spend trans uh, double spend coins or steal people's money and so on and so forth. Um, that would actually still be secure because you can just um, inject a new rule on the on the client nodes to say just ignore or all transactions that double that double spend or um, like steal people's money or break the rules in some way. But in order to actually figure out um, which is the first transaction, for example, if there's multiple transactions trying to spend the same coins, you, you need data availability uh, because you need the complete set of all transactions to figure out which one came first. And so that's why uh, data availability is important as like, uh, fun as it's fundamentally important for any layer one blockchain in addition to consensus. Yeah, I, I mean, I, like I think the way that I, the way that I might think about this and you know, how this debate has kind of played out in the Bitcoin community. In Bitcoin, people have worked really hard to make sure that normal operators, people like, you know, you and me can run full nodes. And that's so that you can check the full history of the blockchain, have availability for all of the data in the history of the network. Um, but, you know, that property comes at a huge cost for Bitcoin. And there's engineering solutions to how to provide that data availability, right? Am I kind of thinking about that the right way? Yes, I mean, there's several aspects here. Um, mm -hmm. One of the limitations of um, kind of designs where, so with, with systems like Bitcoin, for example, um, the execution and consensus are coupled together. So what we mean by that is that if you're a node and you want to kind of, down, you want to kind of follow the blockchain and figure out um, which chain is the correct chain that everyone agrees on, not only do you have to download the blocks and make sure the blocks, like make sure the data behind those blocks have actually been published, you need to actually execute every single transaction in that block because the execution rules of that of, of the transactions are baked into the are, are coupled with the consensus. Yes. So that a block should only have can only have consensus if and if um all the blocks all the execution oh sorry, all the transactions in the block. Uh, are valid, but the idea with Lazy Ledger is like we we can say we can decouple those two things. We can decouple consensus and execution. We can say that let's just have a chain where where anything goes, like any message you can you can post any message you like. There's no rules about what you can and can't post, right? Everything is valid, and so therefore that means in order to check uh, which chain is valid, in order to actually download the blocks and check that this chain is the correct chain. Um, you just have to verify that the data behind the blocks have been published, but you don't have to actually execute every transaction in every block because um, it doesn't matter if they're valid or not. Um, so to check, that, uh, to check that a block has consensus, you just care if that the data behind the block is available. You don't, you don't actually care about the actual contents of the block. And it turns out that um, Scaling data availability is a lot easier than scaling execution. Um, like one of the things I've said before is, what like what is the most scalable decentralized system on, in history? Uh, it's BitTorrent. Like BitTorrent once at one point handled half the internet. Uh, sorry, handled half of the internet's um, traffic. Um, like back before Netflix, you know, in the early two thousands, when everyone was just downloading you know movies of, of, from torrents, like. BitTorrent um, handled you know, half the internet traffic. So obviously it scaled. But the reason why it was most so scalable because it was just a data distribution network. Um, like it's just peers sharing chunks of data with each other. There's no actual execution um, going on in terms of um, you know, the files that are being distributed. So like la laser ledger scalability kind of follows a similar paradigm where um, the, the paradigm is such that um, different clients download different pieces of, of the block 
and they can distribute it from each, with each other. So the more users you have in the system, um, the greater the block sizes you can store securely. So uh, as a you know as a blockchain, I'm only looking at a subset of transactions coming through this lazy ledger chain to make up the state of my state machine. Yeah, this is kind of a random question, but uh, can those subsets of data intersect between? Can like I have one app that's looking at you know this piece of data, and then there's also a, an intersection with that data with another application that's looking at it, or you know, is it is each one of these data streams kind of independent for these independent applications? So I wouldn't say uh, like I, I don't see a direct reason for there to be intersection, but it could be the case that. Um, someone might create an app that takes a dependency on the data of another app. Um, mm -hmm. So, like that could be, for example, a one uh, a bridge between two apps. Um, like if two apps want to communicate with each other, then two apps can access the data of of each other's apps. Okay. Yeah, I guess that was kind of the use case I was thinking of. So, it, talk to me a little bit more about the the data availability layer. You know, I think you mentioned at the at the top of the show about fraud proofs and availability proofs, and these are two kind of newer cryptographic techniques in terms of running in production. But I would imagine that as a user, if I want to submit a transaction to a lazy ledger application, you know, I'm submitting a application to the lazy ledger chain. I'm proving that this data is available over on this subset of nodes over here, and, and then the it gets included in the in the block. Is that is that kind of how the process works? Right. So maybe a bit of backstory or uh, history could be fun. Um, yeah. So to go back definitely. to your, uh, I, uh, I love some history, by the way. <laughs> yeah. To go back to your kind of um, what you were saying initially about the initial kind of Bitcoin scalability debate. Mm -hmm. You know, back in two thousand and thirteen, uh, or back in, you know even before that, um, like. Bitcoin blocks were like, like almost like half full, and you know I was kind of like talking to people in the Bitcoin community, and and, and I was like saying, "Aren't you scared that bit, the, what what are you going to do when the blocks become full?" Like, uh, and pe and and people were like, yeah, "It's not going to be a problem." And you know I was talking to people like Gregory Maxwell, and he was saying, "You know, it's not it's not going to happen for a very long time." But then it happened the next year, and then the blocks you know became full, and then transaction fees skyrocketed. And um, then they became this split in the Bitcoin community uh, because a lot one one half of the community wanted to kind of increase the block size limit. Big uh, blockers, big, yeah, big blockers. And then there were the small blockers, which um, didn't want to increase the block size limit. And the reason for that was their argument was that if you increase the block size limit, um, you increase the costs to run a full node. And it becomes more and more and more expensive for normal users to verify that the blockchain um, is actually valid. And so, like, you have to trust the miners more. Like, if no one can validate the chain except for miners, then the miners can collude together to um, kind of inject to change the rules of the chain. And no one can, no one will care or do it. Can't or no one can do anything about it because they're not. No one's validating the chain anymore except for like a few big players. And so that, that's why small blockers were against doing that. You know, I, I, I think that that's that that's a really interesting an interesting debate that's kind of played out over and over again in blockchains over the years. And if you look at what's happening with Binance Smart Chain, you know, the Ethereum people were thought of by Bitcoiners as like these serious big blockers for a long time because you know they've got a complex state machine running on top of their network. Um, yeah. But, you know, the Ethereum people look over at what Binance Smart Chain is doing and they're like, they turned it all up to 11. <laughs> and now, you know, if you if you try to sync the Binance Smart Chain network, it takes months. It's, uh, you know, it, the software is not going to support the amount of data that's there. So, you know, this scalability argument in, in these different uh, strategies for dealing with it is something that we are dealing with as a community today. We just don't think about it. <laughs> And I think the other thing that I would add there um, is that the way that Bitcoin has ended, the way that Bitcoin and these blockchains have kind of ended up scaling is by just making new instances of themselves. And that's exactly kind of what Lazy Ledger is looking to support in a much easier way. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, the, the, the school blocker argument is actually a very good argument. It's a very important argument. And like we're seeing a lot of chains today um, 
you know, I'm not going to name them, but you know, they've seen a lot of chains today that claim to be scalable, but in reality, they've just they're just big blocks. They're just like they're just a blockchain with massive blocks. Um, like in theory, Bitcoin can, can support a billion transactions per second um, if you just increase the block size. Um, but so there's, so the different there's a difference between three port and scalability. Like th th scalability is a lot more about the chain's three port. It's also about um, the cost to act for ordinary users to actually validate the chain for themselves. So with the small blocker argument was that, um, you know, you, it will be too expensive for, for other users to validate the chain. But the counter argument with that to that was that um, you could enable fraud proofs uh, on the chain. Um, and what fraud proofs enable you to do is um, if you run a light client uh, that just follows the block headers of the chain, but does not actually validate the chain, um, it, now, and normally that would be that would be very secure because um, the miners, if if, you want, if the miners collude, they can change the rules of the chain, and light clients can't do anything about it. But with fraud proofs, the idea is that if so, if a, if the miner generates an invalid block, um, they can effectively what they can do is so anyone observing the chain can generate a very succinct um, proof that one of the transactions in the block was invalid. Like I say, a few kilobytes of proof, and they can distribute that proof to to all the users in the network, and they can reject that block. So you basically effectively have this indirect way of um, validating the chain, or having some assurances about the validity of the chain, without direct without directly validating the chain yourself. You just um, so rather than assuming you know rather than assuming that rather than assuming guilty until proving innocence. You assume innocence until proving guilty with fraud proofs. Uh, and that's a lot more scalable. Now, the yeah, definitely. With... I mean, this is this is kind of like the idea of, you know, right now in these blockchain systems, the miners are completely unaccountable to anyone but themselves. But with fraud proofs and the ability to prove wrongdoing and building that into the system, it allows the users to police these miners and punish them in the case where they're trying to steal funds or trying to change the rules of the chain in a way that's not what the users are wanting. Yeah, exactly. So this is kind of a requirement um, for any kind of system that wants to increase on-chain scalability. Uh, it's, an it's an essential component of sharding, uh, sharding, for example. And it's also an essential component of optimistic rollups which I'll discuss why in a moment. Um, but the issue with fraud proofs is that in order to in order for fraud proofs to work, you actually need to be sure that all the data in the chain has actually been made available. Um, because if the miner publishes the block header, but does not actually publish the data behind the header, then no one can generate a fraud proof. So what you need is this other primitive called data availability proofs, which allow light clients to efficiently verify that all the data in the block was actually published in network um, without actually downloading the entire block themselves. With data availability proofs, they can get um, an almost 100% guarantee that the entire block is available by only downloading a few percentage, a few percent of the block, or under one percent of the block. Wow. And so this is um, kind of like an important primitive to kind of um, on -chain, for on-chain scalability whether that be sharding or laser ledger or optimistic rollups. Um, so, so this is how kind of how laser ledger scales validation by using data availability proofs. And what that effectively allows people to do is um, create their own the idea of so the fundamental idea of the laser ledger or like one of the important use cases of laser ledger is that in the future, um, well, people will be able to create their own blockchains uh, like decentralized blockchains within seconds. Like whereas right now at the moment, if you want to create your own decentralized blockchain using something like the Cosmos SDK, you have to effectively create your own validator set or rent some validator set um, and have like your own proof of stake network. Like that's a lot of overhead just to create your own decentralized blockchain. And in a world in a world where you have this internet of blockchains with Cosmos, and potentially there's going to be thousands of blockchains. Um, with their own applications, because every application will have its own blockchain. That is, that's simply not going to be feasible. 
Um, so with Lazy Ledger, we're just providing a, a, a pluggable consensus and data layer that those chains can plug into instead of having their own valid data set. And so that means like you can just define your own chain using Cosmos SDK, for example, and just plug in Lazy Ledger as consensus instead of tournament, and you can very quickly deploy your own decentralized chain. And the way that works is um, these chains are uh, kind of deployed using a kind of technology called optimistic rollups. So you have your own kind of ch chain. All the blocks of your chain are posted onto a data availability layer, such as Lazy Ledger. And you, you only need one validator in your chain. So you don't have to worry about having your own validator set. And that validator is not trusted. And the reason why that validator does not need to be trusted is because they post all the block data onto Lazy Ledger. And so if the validator misbehave if the validator misbehaves and posts a block with invalid transactions, then the data for that is going to be available on Lazy Ledger and anyone can generate a fraud proof. And so that's why the, the validator does not need to be trusted. Okay, uh, so that's this is excellent. Um, so each chain does still need to run some nodes, some collection of nodes somewhere, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, you have each chain has its own kind of peer-to-peer -peer, uh, sub network of mm -hmm. users, nodes, and light clients, um, because obviously each chain will have its own users, and yeah. these users will be client, you know, clients of the chain, downloading state from the chain, um, distributing block headers in state via the PSP network. Uh, so, but there's no security requirements on the set of kind of light clients. Like light clients are just users. Like they don't, you know, they don't play a security role. Whereas with validators, they play an important security role. Um, yeah. So like, it's very difficult to deploy a, a new chain securely and have it and, and instantly have a secure validator set. And so that's why with Lazy Ledger, for the first time, you can deploy a, a new decentralized blockchain securely um, by inheriting the consensus and security of the Lazy Ledger main chain. And this is really important because, like, and then I mean, also, you know, from an engineering perspective, it allows you to start very small, maybe with one or two nodes or validators on the network that support all of the transactions. And then as the network grows and the need for serving that data to a number of clients grows, you can grow the number of chains on the network to support those users in a much more organic way than having to take this huge step change from no validators to 40 to 100 in order to get the kind of decentralization you're looking for. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that is one potential route for chains. Like um, if a chain becomes big enough, then it might decide to kind of branch out into its own validator set. Um, even though we don't necessarily think that's necessary, that is what like that is one potential option. Um, like the whole kind of idea is that if you're looking at this in the context of IBC, for example, like as I mentioned, um, if we envision a future where there's thousands of, let's say like let's say we make deploying a new blockchain as easy as deploying a new smart contract, you know, there could easily be tens of thousands of of, of, of app specific chains communicating with each other. Now, the, the security assumptions of IBC at the moment is that when two Cosmos uh, zones or two Cosmos chains communicate with each other, um, each Cosmos zone assumes that each other Cosmos zone has a secure validator set, um, such that two thirds of the validators are honest in each in each Cosmos zone they communicate with. Um, if they're not dishonest, they can do like really bad things like steal, steal funds. Uh, but in a future where there's tens of, tens of thousands of chains, you know, it's it's very unlikely for that to be the case. Um, so 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 we're kind of thinking of a future past this 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 secure committee assumption. Uh, we're trying to replace this two thirds validator honesty assumption with um, more of a honest minority assumption, where we just assume where we rely on fraud proofs to make sure that the validators are honest, then assuming that a certain number of them are honest. That makes a lot of sense. So how many different applications do you, do you think one lazy ledger chain can support? Uh, I mean, in theory, the scalability properties of lazy ledger um, 
the data availability capacity of laser layer scales with number of users. Um, mm -hmm. So there's, this, there's there's linear scaling. Um, so like, so there's there's going to be a fee market for block space, but the size of the blocks should be proportional to the number of users in the network that are helping to store the blocks. So in theory, it, it should scale linearly, so that the more users are in the network and the more applications there are, the greater the capacity of the network. That makes a lot of sense. So because each chain only stores a subset of the blocks, as you scale the amount of chains, the central chain itself can grow kind of arbitrarily large and still have all of that data stored out on the sub chains. Um, whereas the central chain only has the proofs of all of that data across all of the sub networks. That is yep. really <laughs> very interesting, Mustafa. Um, okay, we do have a quick question. Um, Pramod Rohit asks, um, at the data layer, can we compare subsets of lazy ledger data to subgraphs part of the graph network? Can you please let us know how this is different from using an indexed curated subgraph with the specific data? Yeah, so as far as my understanding of the graph, um, so like the graph is a, a system for querying state of various uh, chains or applications. Um, Indexing EVM specific data, basically. Yeah, or not even if it's not EVM specific. Generally speaking, the graph is about like querying st like the state of chains, like let's say accounts and balances, for example. Uh, but uh, on the lazy ledger main chain, um, the subsets of lazy ledger data is not the state of the chain. You still have to actually execute all the transactions. So the lazy to the lazy ledger data is just a list. Of, it's just the actual transactions that have been published to the chain. But to actually get the state of your application, you actually have to execute um, the transactions to figure out what everyone's balances are. For example. So. Um, so you can envision, for example, like um, each application or each chain that uses lazy ledger, they will it will have its own state, and the graph, for example, could you can query the state of each chain via the graph, for example. Yeah, I, I think that that's a that's a good example. Um, I think that it, it, it's kind of difficult to think of the system that you're describing, and I think that that's kind of probably been a huge challenge for you with Lazy Ledger is describing this to a lot of different people. You know, my experience with describing really challenging concepts to folks is that everyone kind of needs to hear it in a slightly different way. <laughs> so you end up out there kind of describing it over and over again. Um, but there, there is this kind of difference between this indexed subset of data versus, you know, this, this proved and available subset of data that makes up another network um, via something like lazy ledger um, because basically with the graph all that's being done is the data is being indexed in the database whereas with lazy ledger the data is being uh, you know validated and accepted by a separate network um, that is holding that yeah data I, I mean, to put it more simply right uh, if you take a block um, a block header consists of might consist of two things, or like at least Ethereum block headers mm. consists of like two main things conceptually. Uh, mm. It consists of the Merkle root of all the transactions in that block. That's the first thing, and the second thing yeah. it, con it contains a state commitment uh, to the, all the balances, all account balances um, in the Ethereum state. Uh, now, Lazy Ledger is is more centered around the first thing which is the actual transactions in the blocks, whereas the graph is more centered about the second thing, which is the state of everyone's balances, and it allows you to, to query them. That's a that's a great way to describe it. Um, all right, Mustafa, we're, we're kind of coming up here at the half hour, um, so time to wrap up. Thank you very much for taking the time today to come on and describe Lazy Ledger. And like, I know I personally learned a lot during this conversation, so I, I hope our viewers did as well. Um, before we wrap here, is there anything that you want to talk about, promote? Yeah, I mean, that's, um, yeah, thanks for the conversation. If anyone is interested in um, learning more, then go to the website, lazyledger.org. Um, there's more information there, and you can, you, you can also ask more questions on our Discord. Um, 
when we have one, that's awesome. And, and please go check out lazyledger.org, join their Discord. Um, I am on there. It's a it's an exciting channel. Um, and, and one last question before we run. Um, Amaran Amarnath um, slides this one in right at the right at the end. Um, is Lazy Ledger a replacement or an alternative to the Tenderman consensus framework, or will it work in sync with other consensus frameworks? Uh, I mean, it's alternative in the sense that instead of having to use Tendermint and to deploy new chains, um, you can just use you can plug in Lazy Ledger as a as a consensus layer. So, like one of the things one of the things we're working, for example, is a project called Optimint. And Optimint is a drop-in replacement for Tendermint. So it uses uses the same ABCI interfaces. Um, so you can drop, you can replace Tendermint with Optimint. And what that will allow you to do is implement your Cosmos SDK app as an optimistic rollup that uses Lazy Ledger as a data layer, or as a consensus layer. This it's is something I'm extremely excited about in the sparse Merkle tree work that you guys have been doing to enable that is, is actually a massive upgrade for the whole ecosystem. I guess that leads me to another question, which is what consensus algorithm are you guys going to use for the lazy ledger chain itself? Uh, we're using Tendermint. Tendermint. There we go. Awesome. Well, uh, I, I think on that, let's, uh, let's call it a show. And uh, before we go, I do want to go ahead and say thank you again to our sponsors. Thank you to the Sommelier.Finance folks. I guess thank you myself. Um, and as well as thank you to the Omniflix Media team for producing this. Really appreciate the work that uh, Cicel and his team put in here. And, and thank you guys very much. Um, we will see you next week. I don't have a guest next week, but uh, you'll see on social media. So soon. Um, thank you guys very much for joining us. I appreciate it. Thank you.